Oh, good morning, sexy. Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. A uh, very exciting morning for me. You can see I have received an Amiga 2000. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I had one of these back in the day. Uh, I didn't have it for very long, actually. I think I got the 2000 after I got rid of my 500 plus. Um, but yeah, I really regret having sold it. I let it go for £100 back in the day and it was absolutely mint. Uh, and actually, it was underpriced then really. I let it go cheap just because I was in a rush and needed the money for something else. I can't what, something from a PC I think. Um, yeah, so the one I had, I had uh, the drive populated here. Um, the interesting thing with the 2000, there's lots of different flavours, if you like, of the 2000. You see you can get the Amiga 1500. I'm not entirely sure what the difference between the 1500 and the 2000 is. I might uh, look that up and just put a, a comment up here. Um, but you can also get the 2500. Um, uh, and there's lots of different accelerators that this will support. And obviously this was the first big box Amiga. So this brought in Zorro uh, 2 slots. And with the Zorro 2 slots you could add uh, you know, lots of extra things like network cards and graphics cards and hard disk cards, you know, SCSI interfaces, IDE interfaces, uh, RAM, lots and lots of RAM. Um, the video toaster, I think, that was one of the things you could get for this. Um, but you, they also had, it's got a dedicated CPU slot as well, so you could uh, you know, stick a 68020 or 68030 board. And I think there's actually a 68040 board that will go in one of these as well. And you can actually upgrade that with a little module that plugs onto it. It gives you a 68060. Um, so yeah, very cool. You could also fit a PC card inside this. So yeah, I might see if I can source one of those. And I might have a look at that as well. It was just like, I think it was two options. I think you could either have an XT, you know, 8086, 8088, whatever. Or a 286. There might even be a 386 board, I don't know. Anyway, we'll uh, cover some of that stuff later. So just looking around the case here, you can see you've got a power LED on the front and a hard disk LED. Uh, my nails need cutting again. Um, yeah, this came all the way from Poland, so we'll just have a quick look at it. It seems to have arrived in uh, one piece. Yeah, cats are taking uh, an interest here. The first observation, we've got a screw down there and we have one missing there, so I'll source some replacement screws. We've got obviously some uh, pretty heavy scratching on the sides and things. There's a little bit of corrosion there on the top. Uh, still got the end of the warranty seal there, but I've got no doubt this will have been, you know, someone will have been inside this. Lots of scratches on the top here. Most of this will clean off. Some of these are there, won't, that's deep. Um, but you're never going to get one of these that's, uh, well, you might find one that's absolutely mint, but for the most part, they've been uh, pretty much mishandled as they've been stored for long periods of time. It weighs a ton, this. Uh, yeah, so another screw missing there. So arms are giving up with the weight of the darn thing. So looking around the back, you can see we've got a fan in the power supply there. There's the, the power switch, uh, IEC uh, lead, you know, for the mains. Is that called IEC? I think it is, you know, a normal PC style mains lead. Video port. So we've got the same connectors you'd expect from uh, any other Amiga of that series, really, of that era, you know, like a 500 so your video port. So you could plug, you know, plug an RGB cable there. You could even plug a modulator into that if you wanted. Uh, parallel port and disk drive. As I say, you can support two disk drives internally, but you can add, I think, the four in total in uh, an Amiga. You can have four drives. So you could, you know, plug uh, a drive in there and then plug another drive into the back of that one. And you've got four floppy drives. Mono video, just like you get on an Amiga. Left audio, right audio, serial port. And then you've got lots of these ports here, uh, you know, to give you expandability. You know, your cards will go inside the thing there and you'll have a connector on the back here. Maybe one for network, maybe one for uh, video, some sort of video interface. In fact, the video interface is here actually. It's got a dedicated video uh, interface slot. So that's quite cool as well. Again, we've got a screw missing from there. The fact I've spotted screws missing already, I'm going to uh, look at the uh, service mail for this and I'll order up some screws of the right size. And we'll swap out the ones on the outside for brand new ones and move some of the existing ones into anywhere in the inside where they're perhaps missing. And underneath on the front here you can see we've got the keyboard connector and your two joystick ports. Uh, that one's looking a little bit uh, dark compared to the pins there. So I thought I'd share this photo. Um, I think it might have been my mum suggesting I took a photo at the time. I honestly can't remember. But uh, yeah, if she did suggest it, uh, I appreciate it because I wish I had more photos like this. Um, yeah, that's how geeky I am. I like looking back at all the things I had. 
you can see an old PC there on the desk. That was, I think, my second or third PC that I built myself. Um, that was like a 386 or 486 at the time, I think. Uh, Citizen printer there, I think. Philips laser display on a bottom shelf. Um, I think it was like a Logitech cup because they used to, you know, supply uh, spares and parts and things like that. Uh, loads of joysticks on the shelf up there. The old, my old first TV. Uh, but you can see the Amiga there. There's the A2000 sat on the desk there. So I don't know how old I was at the time. Maybe 19, 20, something like that. Maybe a bit older. Maybe 21. I don't think so. I think I was around tw 20 or just below. Um, but you can see on top of it, a tea towel. <laughs> the reason being there's a SNES. I remember distinctly covering my SNES with a tea towel um, and sat it on there. You can see the ST as well there. See that? Atari ST on the end, ST mouse. You can see keyboard space was uh, <laughs> a bit tight here. I forgot what I did with the keyboard. I, I can't remember whether it was, uh, I think I just plugged it in when I needed it. It either sat on the side of the machine somewhere or at the back. It might be at the back there, I can't quite see. And I just plugged it in when I needed it. So this was described as working, but you know what, I'm going to go inside this, we need to do a lot of things to this I'm sure, including, you know, sorting out, recapping the, the power supply. Um, it was described, I think, as uh, having a Rev4 board, so this might be identical to the one I've already shown, but we will soon find out, so there's just one screw on this side and one on the other side. There we go. And I think the lid should just come off the front, if I remember rightly. Yeah, there we go. So there we go, I can clean that up later. So straight away I've spotted a piece of sponge there that should not be there. That should be stuck on the inside of the lid. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute, but we're going to need to glue that back on somehow. And the first thing I've spotted, look at all that horrible greeny blue corrosion down here. There's tons of it. So yeah, it really, really annoys me, including the battery left on it. You know what's annoying about this one is the seller said that this was one of his surplus uh, 2000s that he'd had in storage, you know, for a long period of time as part of his collection, in quotes, and uh, he just needed some funds, so he was selling off one of his, his extra models. Why the hell, if he's had this in his collection for a number of years, hasn't he taken that battery off there? And it looks like he's not even tried to clean this up. Not at all, just left it. Um, I think uh, I might just power this up uh, now actually, just see what it's doing before I disturb anything, take anything out of it, uh, and we'll just see whether it's, uh, it is working as it's described as working. But the other thing I will show you before we power it up is, I don't know if you can see it, I think it says Rev6. Yeah, Rev6. So it's not Rev4 at all. I wonder if it's got an 8372A on it. I hope so. And there's a sticker on the back of the motherboard there that says Rev 6.2A, actually, I think, is it? Or is it 6.2? There's no A, I'm imagining things. If I switch it on, all we've got connected here is power and video. You can see, power light, hard disk. Not sure why that hard disk light, not sure why that hard disk light looked illuminated. Um, yeah, it does look like it's illuminated. There's no hard disk in here. That's weird. Um, as you can see, it's booted up, 1.3. Fantastic. So the fact that power supply is quite um, quiet, I was, you, you might have thought I was going to say loud there, but yeah, it's quite quiet actually, it doesn't sound noisy, it's not rattling, so yeah, I don't think I need to swap the fan out on that, but I will need to obviously service it. Uh, there were some modifications that are worth doing to some of these as well, with it being a later machine, you know, that, well, I'm assuming, unless this has been cannibalised at some point and it's got a power supply from an earlier machine, I would assume that the, the one of the modifications you need to do inside there, I think there's a capacity you need to add or something somewhere. Um, yeah, I might ne not, not need to do that, but we'll uh, cross that bridge when we come to it. So I think the next thing we'll do is try and remove the, the drive bay here and the power supply in order that we can have a look at the motherboard, remove the motherboard and uh, just clean it up. Um, I won't bore you with as much uh, time here as what we've done with the previous board that you've seen because it's going to be a similar thing. I'm hoping that this one might be more cleanable in the sense that uh, you know I don't have to go to town on it and spend uh, hours and hours and hours scratching it all back to copper. It might be uh, a bit easier to clean up. I mean, it does, the kind of blueness to it makes me think that it did leak and then someone's treated it with something and that's, that's why we've got a funny colour there now rather than the typical corrosion you see on these. So it might be more manageable. So we've got that one screw on the back there, and there are two screws here. So I'm going to carefully uh, just uh, pull the floppy connector off here if I can. Yeah, I'm a bit of a weird angle. There we go, that's that, and the power, I don't know if you can see this. 
we just need to just carefully, there we go, pull it straight up, it's off there now. I'll disconnect the cables from the back of the drive. Yeah, we can pull the floppy one out. So I'm guessing the power supply should come straight out. There's nothing holding that in there, there we go, out. Sweet. And there's some good news, we can just see there through the little gap, 8372A. So yeah, it's the 1 meg chip version, which is nice. We've got an interesting mod going on back here. I don't know if this is factory or, you know, a compatibility fix for some of the Zorro uh, cards. Well, I think this might be related to the uh, CPU slots here, actually. Although it could be the Zorro slot stuff, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you so better look at the corrosion there. You can see it looks horrible, but yeah, we've got some resistor packs soldered onto uh, one side of those uh, chips there. I can't remember the 245s or something, those. I think they might be. Um, anyway, so the next thing to do is get the drive bay out. So after removing the power supply, it's loose on this side, but we have two more screws on this side here. I um, mean, the nice thing so far, I haven't spotted any missing screws on the inside. It looks like it's just those two or three missing from the outside. So yeah, I don't need to replace uh, tons and tons of screws. So that whole thing then just comes off. Ouch, look how green that is. Oh my God, I don't know about uh, being more manageable than that last one. Yeah, we're only going to be able to tell when we get a cotton bud onto there and start trying to clean that up, but... I mean, maybe it is, because if you look around here, there's not so much corrosion. There is here, yeah, there's a few wires, but actually the traces there look alright. There's one or two wires here that look questionable. I'm guessing at the very minimum, least, you know, very minimum, I'm going to have to replace the socket, but it's very, very green, isn't it? It really is. There's a fuse on this one. That's different to the previous board. I don't remember seeing a fuse there. Ah, and there's the other obvious kind of difference. You tend to find that when they moved on to the 8372A, this is when they brought in the use of the 44256 chips, you know, the smaller, uh, chip, well, the larger, you know, larger capacity. Uh, extra pins on them as well. So you only need uh, four of these for half a meg. So we've got a meg there. Um, it's much more manageable when you get them like this because if you get a fault, it's just, you know, one of eight chips instead of one of 32 blooming chips. So I've sort of covered what all the chips and things do on the uh, previous videos here uh, and the slots and things, you know, this is the video uh, interface slot so you can put a graphics card of some sort in there. Uh, we've got some corrosion on some of the pins here, so this is the CPU card slot. Um, and then you've got the 502 slots here. So again, one or two of the pins there might need cleaning up. Uh, and at the back we've got the uh, PC uh, slots here, you know, two 16-bit. AT slots and uh, the uh, XT slots here and again you've got the optional things here so you can have four 16-bit slots there. The idea is you plug a PC card in and then you've got three three slots for things for the PC, you know, a graphics card, a sound card, a video card, etc. Um, you might want a hard disk or something as well. I'm not quite sure how that all links to the Amiga side. I think you can actually have the PC within a window on the Amiga, if that makes sense, you know, you open up uh, uh, an app, you start an app to launch the PC and you can view it within the Amiga desktop, which is really cool. Uh, a bit like Acorn did with the ARM stuff, um, you know, because you could have a PC on those RISC, some of those RISC machines, couldn't you? So, new version of Buster, uh, 5721, and a decent version of Gary here, 5719, instead of the crusty one that was on that old Rev 4 board. Now, the interesting thing about the two of these boards that I've looked at, is um, I don't see any PAL chips. I was looking through the schematics and it worried me a little bit because as I was flipping through the pages there, I kept seeing PAL, PAL 16 V8 or whatever, PAL, all these PALs, there was like several PALs I spotted on different pages of the schematics. I haven't seen one, I haven't seen one on this board, I haven't seen one on the others, but I was looking at the 2000 service manual. So, hmm, please comment down below, are there some of these 2000s that have got PALs on? Instead of some of this discrete, uh, discrete logic, maybe they reduced some of this. Uh, maybe it might have been an initial version that had PALs, or I might have been looking at a page for something else. It might have been a page for some sort of CPU bridge or something like that that needs PALs. Um, might even be the one for the PC bridge for the back or whatever. So we need to get the screws out. There's just one or two screws, and then these little clips here, like you get in PC cases. Uh, maybe some of these might need to come out, I'm not sure there's one there, another clip there, another clip there, maybe these, I don't know, I can't see underneath that. So I had to disconnect these two LEDs, it went with the uh, two connections there, you know, the two wires 
uh, at the top so the unused pin was at the bottom there which is obvious really and it was the same with that one it went uh, you know up that way as far as it, it could uh, that's more for, my, more for my benefit than yours but then I also had to unscrew this you know there's a bolt goes on one end and here it just goes through a hole and then the other end of it just went to one of the expansion slots here uh, just to get the board out and then once I got all the screws out it's just a case if you just squeeze these you know if you squeeze there's a little plastic notch and then the board just slides up slide it up gradually over each one there was the one screw there going through the mouse port holding it into the chassis and there was one back there on one of the ports there the floppy drive port or something I think just holding the board there so now we've got that out of the way let's uh, remove the battery uh, I'm going to snip it off uh, just carefully I can always desolder the points from underneath and stuff um, in a minute I might mangle the pads doing this this is the only problem doing this Yeah, there we go, it's pretty much free. There's still a little bit here holding it on, I think, and a bit here, maybe, there we go. So, that's the battery off. And we'll go at this now with some white uh, distilled vinegar. I'm just curious to see what happens to the surface here as we do this. You know, we might be lucky. We might be lucky, because it looks like it's just bringing off the uh, solder mask. I think the solder mask is uh, the thing that has been eaten into uh, a little of the actual connections because like you can see two traces there the largely okay a bit corroded over here a bit corroded over there but yeah I think this one might be uh, needing less work than the previous board you know I'm thinking this has had vinegar poured on it in the past you know maybe that's one credit to the person that did own this because it doesn't seem, you know, can you see the solder mask is okay? Yes, we've got some of it coming off, uh, but I think the majority of this, look, it's just superficial. It's just uh, where the solder mask has just deteriorated a little bit. But I still think I'm going to need a new socket. Because I think when we get this off here, the pins are going to be green. They look, look how oxidised they look here, you're really dark and dull. So, uh, yeah, it will at the very least need a new socket there. We might need to swap out the uh, ROM socket as well. There's some nasty looking wires there, look. They're particularly uh, affected. But then again, with a bit of vinegar, it's looking a bit better. Ooh, and there as well. Ooh. It might not work after I've done, done this. This is the other thing. You know, we're interfering with the connectivity of the surface here. Any of these little particles of metal that were just or solder that were just joining something up, up there after I've wiped over them it might not work anymore so yeah we definitely got things we need to do here lots of black traces there look yeah that area is certainly going to need scratching back there's a lot of dirt on the board though that might be one of the re reasons why the battery corrosion has uh, not done quite as much damage because the dirt has kind of like been a protective layer it, that's what it looks like the areas that with lots of dirt on seems to have taken less damage so let's get that CPU out and see what the damage is here Yeah, so CPU pins looking a bit grey and green there. We can probably clean that up. Uh, yeah, look at this here. Yeah, so whilst technically cleaning this might, you might get away with it. You know, there are some green pins. There's about four or five, six green pins here. I'm sure there's probably going to be the odd little bit up there, and there's one or two here that are green. But actually, it's not too bad just there. I've seen them, you know, obviously we've seen worse. That last, that last one was a bit worse. But there's lots of damage around here on this one. Yeah, I removed the ROM chip and uh, that looks okay. The socket there does look okay. Uh, I'm going to have a good uh, scrub around with uh, some vinegar now. I'm just going to pour some into a cap like this. Uh, get the toothbrush there. Uh, and just have a good uh, scrub around all of these uh, things around here. It doesn't evaporate this, so you need to mop this up. You know, you can leave it on there for a few minutes first just to, you know affects the alkaline you know you want it to neutralize the alkaline that's the whole idea with putting acid like this on here and then we can wash over it with IPA uh, and use the toothbrush in the same sort of way 
but it does seem more superficial here there are obviously some traces and flares and things there but I might just do that I might just focus on here clean up this way and just see what we can get away with I guess there's a couple of ways of looking at it because in some cases you might just be able to get away with some pretty thorough cleaning we could always revisit this you could argue I'm being a bit lazy because I spent so long on that last board um, but again is it going to be a particularly interesting video for if I'm doing exactly the same things I did on the previous board there possibly not well, probably not actually it's probably going to be yeah probably going to be a, a boring video if I do the same exact things to this board as we did to the last one but whereas this one we might be able to clean it let's just try let's just see how we can get away with cleaning um, and do the bare minimum with this it'll be a good uh, case study I guess I don't know because I'm going to be using this as my main 2000 it be interesting to see if at some point we do get a failure with one of these traces so I used the toothbrush uh, vinegar on the board and the chips here well this chip uh, an IPA you can see it's it's come up really clean there's very little uh, in the way of damage here yeah hang on you can damage uh, using a fiberglass pen like this obviously you know a bit of ESD generated from the friction of moving it there but yeah those pins look all right so that's had a wipe with IPA it seems surp uh, superficial surface corrosion on some of these things here so somebody has I think treated this with vinegar in the past I guess there's an argument there's no point in removing the battery because once the battery's leaked that's it and the only there comes a point there's nothing else for it to leak but I would still remove the battery if you've got you know if you're planning on storing something like this if you've got the patience to deal with it at least remove the blooming battery from the thing so we're testing off the carpet here but it booted the first time no worries at all you can see the pins here on the CPU, just a little bit of oxidisation or corrosion still. Uh, but the socket is good, there's no green pins, you know, there was only three or four actually green pins here and one or two on this side. But they've cleaned up okay with the vinegar. Um, so this, I guess this is just to show you that you don't always perhaps need to replace everything. Some of these traces could burn out with a bit of current over time. What I think I'm going to do is just clean up the uh, the vias here, you know, uh, scratch the surface of them to get them uh, silvery looking again. Use the fiberglass pen on the little black bits around here, um, certainly around here, you know, around the battery bit here, and these traces here. Um, I think I will do that. Maybe turn up the ones around here and just get a bit of nail polish over some of the little bits there. But I don't think I'm going to swap the socket out. I'm going to take a risk with this. It is a risk, but I'm going to take it. Um, and clean up the little connections here as well with the fiberglass pen. But what I'm trying to show you, I guess, and being lazy at this time, like I say, is just showing you, you sometimes you can get away with the bare minimum on these just to get these up and running. So the next thing I will do here is I'll just carefully remove the ROM. You can see the top of the ROM needs cleaning up. I didn't uh, clean that chip. I cleaned its pins, but not the top of it. Let me just move that drive out of the way. So I'll get the Logic Diag in there. I just want to test the RAM. We'll test the CIA timers and things and just make sure that it's okay from that, that aspect. So yeah, ECS Agnes 8372R4, OCS Denise, total memory 1 meg. Uh, real time clock none. I think that's because there's no battery. It says that when there's no battery. Um, exit. We can do the uh, CR2032 mod to this in, in a bit. We'll wait till I've cleaned up first. So let's go into the range at memory test and we'll, we'll just fire it off. Uh, expansion memory not found. Oh, of course, it's chip mem, isn't it? Yeah, it's not classed as Ranger on this one because it's got the A3728, it's going to be all chip RAM. So we'll do a fast test first to make sure it's okay. If that passes, then I'll uh, change the options. You can do that with the right mouse button. Yeah, that's fine. So if we go back down to that, click the right mouse button, you can change the options. So number of RAM chips, uh, there's actually eight. So let's just change that. Eight. Four bits, that's correct, calc. Test, we'll do all. We'll do one test. Uh, in fact, we'll just leave it going through a few. Actually, I'll just let's just put that on five. Turn, and we'll go down. I'm assuming that's right. It says number of banks too. Yeah, that's right. 
and then when you go over the exit bit, it's left click to test using the settings you've... Oh, it's frozen. Look at that, we've got an error. So we do have a problem with corrosion, I think. Yeah, power on, power off, seems to get it to come back up, but we've definitely got something, look, we've definitely got something weird going on. So, yeah, we're going to need to remove that chip socket, I think, at the very least, and uh, swap that out. Well, this is exactly the reason, I guess, why it's best not to leave it untreated. You know, if I'd just not done anything and let, used this board for a few weeks, at some point this would have started happening where a fail, failure occurred because one of those uh, traces. Yeah, you see, that is not normal. So you can see I started scratching one or two of the traces and things around here and just using the fiberglass panel a little bit. More scratching is required. Um, yeah, you've got to scratch the surface of these vias because, uh, you know, you don't get that dark grey stuff off the top. It's like the solder's uh, changed. It's got like an alkaline, a crystallised alkaline thing on the surface of it and it just stops you from putting any solder on it and it's, it just looks awful so you've got to scratch over the tops of them and you've got to scratch off the uh, damage. I was hoping to avoid this but obviously we can't. Ouch! At the underside of the board as well. You know the corrosion's got right under here. I mean it might be that someone's put vinegar on this, I don't know. It's, but still, yeah, it's a mess there. That's going to need cleaning up. Anyway, let's get the uh, socket off here. So I'm going to use the dissolve station on this. And I didn't realise this, but oh my god, what's happened to the back end of the board as well? Look at this. Super dirty and corroded or something. What's happened there? And presumably the alkaline's got on the back end of the board as well. Oh, this one could be a nightmare. And we've got an interesting thing going on here. Looks like someone swapped out the hybrid or something at some point, I think. Or something under there, I don't know. Is that the hybrid? It's the hybrid, yeah. Uh, and uh, put a wire here. That might be a factory mod, but yeah, nevertheless, it's a bit strange. Anyway, I've removed most of the solder now, so I'm just going to do my usual thing of uh, grabbing a couple of, you know, two or three pins and have a little pivot like this, just snaps them off. But I think we're there because it's, yeah, it's just pushed through, you know, just been able to pull it straight through without doing anything. There we go, suck it off. So, yeah, pins around here are a bit green. Uh, I don't really see any damage there, if I'm honest. I think this isn't really the problem with this, this isn't perhaps why. It was uh, failing a minute ago. Anyway, we'll just clean up around there now. So much like that previous uh, video, I'll stick a link to it uh, up here. If you want to see more uh, detailed close-up work on how to uh, clean up some of this stuff. Um, I'm just going over some vinegar now. I've been scratching the connections uh, around here, you know, some of these wires and stuff. Um, and going over them with the fiberglass pen. Yeah, some are cleaner than others. Some may need more work. So it's going to be super hard to show you this, the two wires here, these had corrosion on this side of the board and I think it's uh, one of these two wires that's the problem. If I measure that one there, um, sorry if I move the camera while I'm trying to do this. Yeah, so that one, as you can see, we have a joint to the other side, but watch with this one here. Yeah, you see that one there, there's no join to the other side. So yeah, I'm going to uh, just get a drill bit into there, clean that out. Uh, and then just get some flux and solder and try and uh, tin it all the way through. So I've cleaned up and tinned up all around the uh, socket there. There's some traces here that need tinning up. And one or two there that I'll just cover with some nail polish, I think. But I'm going to get the socket on now. Um, and then I think we'll just try it. I don't think it's going to fix it. One or two of the wires here were bad. That needs flood filling again. There's still some bad wires. We still need to do more work around here, tin these up. But I'm just curious to test it at each stage to see where the actual fault was, you know, because it was working originally and then we cleaned up and it was working for a few minutes and then it went off. Uh, and I'm guessing it's something around here, but it might not be, it might be this chip, because there is a bit of corrosion around there. I think I'll take that off and socket that up. We might replace this, but actually the corrosion doesn't seem to have got to that. It seems to be, it seems to have just flooded and leaked this way. But one or two of the corner pins here could be affected. So it's back up and running. Uh, 
I haven't finished cleaning up around here, still got more things to tin up, some nail polish to cover things over with and lots more cleaning. But it's been a bit easier than the last one. Uh, when I first tested it, black screen, found a broken wire. I'll show you how to do some repairs to those in a minute. Tested it again, black screen still. Tested around this uh, vicinity, found another wire not passing through to the side. Plugged that and as you can see, it's working. So, uh, yeah, I just need to just finish cleaning up now. Uh, I'm in two minds as to whether to remove the ROM socket and the 244 because it does seem like the majority of the corrosion is quite confined to around the battery area. I don't see any corroded pins around the uh, ROM socket um, and the 244, whilst there's some traces there that have been able to tin leading up to it, the pins look okay on it. It's pretty clean around there actually. So now that it's working, I'm going to focus on cleaning up the rest of the board, uh, obviously the underside of the back end of it. Well, the front end of it, depending on which way I look at it, is uh, awful, you know, this end up here on the underside. But if you just look how much dust and dirt there is on this, look at that, that's black. It's covered in dirt, so it's going to take me a good 20 minutes to go around this, but yeah, I'll go over everything, over the tops of the chips, into all the little nooks and crannies and corners and things. I might get the toothbrush into certain places. Look at the dirt that's coming off the top of these chips. It smells really sooty as well, it's like black. Um, I wonder if this has been used in a room where a coal fire has been used. Because many of us actually had coal fires in the uh, 80s and 90s actually. Uh, we had a coal fire at home, uh, mum and dad always used to, you know, spend 20 minutes in the morning clearing out the ashes from the night before, and cleaning it out and stuff and putting new coals and wood and stuff on it. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's got coal fumes, you know, smoke, black, thick black smoke. So I've cleaned up all the uh, flux from the socket there. You can still see some streaks, I need to do the top side of the board. Uh, and I've cleaned off the bottom edge, you know, there's a bit of light corrosion here. I need to resolder some of these points here. I'll reflow the keyboard uh, connections here. I'll remove the old solder, put some new on, and do the same here. Might be a bit fiddly on the ones on the ground because it's going to absorb so much uh, uh, heat. Clean up any of these ground points like this with the fiberglass pan just to make sure it gets a nice uh, good ground with anything that mounts on there. I'm guessing the screw mounts on the, on the case might make with that. So I'll give that uh, part another go in a minute, the bit I've just shown you. Um, just because it needs another white with IPA, but I'm going to get some vinegar onto here because I'm thinking this is probably some of the acid. Uh, sorry, alkaline that has leaked. So we'll just try and neutralise that and I'll just try and wash it off with some IPA. There's lots of hairs and stuff on here. So it took an incredible amount of time to clean last night actually. I must have spent uh, two hours with cotton buds and scrubbing the underside of the board. If I just tilt this at the right angle, you can see this kind of like a white sort of chalky appearance. Let me try to rotate the board. Can you see there on the bottom of it? It's like a chalky appearance there that's been left from the corrosion. Uh, and it's the same. And it's the same up the top here. Now, the interesting thing is if you wipe this, it comes off. So, yeah, it just needs more cleaning. You might just be able to see we've got a fixed wire here. When I was scrubbing, because this was corrosion down here, one of the traces just dis disintegrated here. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's barely hanging on. The trace, you know, you could have maybe stuck a bit of solder over the bit of the trace to join it back up, but it would just be flimsy as anything. Now, the other thing is, it's left these pins here in a right state. You can see I've reflowed a couple here. So I need to inspect this super closely now and uh, reflow any others that just look questionable. But there's so many connections affected around here, it's going to take me some time to make sure that this is just right. Uh, even one of the connections up here on that you can't quite see it, on the power connector, we're looking a bit suspicious. Uh, and there's a few other connections around there that need uh, some work. So in total, I probably resoldered about four or five points around this back area here. Um, I had to use my little scratchy tool and scratch off. There's like a like a, a creamy sort of white ring around anything where there'd been flux. It was like the remnants of the flux that had gone weird from the uh, alkaline effect in it. So it took an incredible amount of time to, to do that actually. And that white, uh, you know, that chalky appearance of the board, I was really struggling to get that off. I cleaned it with the IPA again. It was even worse. The whole board was white. And you know what I did? I just got the brush on here like this and it brushed straight off. It was like a chalky powder that was kind of left after the IPA and as you can see it seemed to do the job 
you know, all that white stuff has gone, actually. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove the battery contacts here. Uh, I'll remove the solder from the keyboard connections and reflow those because they're just awful. Um, I'll have an inspection around this side because I haven't inspected the bottom side of the board here where the mouse ports and things are just to make sure the solder points there are okay. But then I'm going to do the battery mod to this. So I've cranked the temperature up just a little bit. Uh, in previous videos where I was doing the recap work and I was like really struggling to get the caps off with uh, this uh, iron. Do you know what the issue was? You wouldn't believe it. This knot here was not tightened up. Therefore, the tip was not making a perfect, uh, you know, thermal coupling with the, uh, you know, metal part there. That's all it was. Uh, I was shocked actually um, when I came to remove the 68,000 socket on this. Realised that that was just floating around, and I tightened it up here, and I had to tighten it an awfully long way. It, it was almost falling off, uh, and then it went, and then it made a really good. Uh, you know obviously thermal connection to the board and I had no problems at all removing the socket so we'll add some uh, solder to this as we do this again I perhaps not got the right size tip for this but I'm not even sure if that's melting yeah it is the solder station needs emptying really because it was a bit full after doing the 68000 socket Anyway, I can reflow those connections now with some fresh solder. So as I say, my solder station needs unblocking, but it's just about got enough suction, I think, to help us just remove these uh, battery contacts here. It's going to take a while, there you go, for it to flow. So I think the pin has just gone up the thing. God, those are awful, seriously awful, the bits that are left there. Anyway, they'll clean up in a minute. This one is going to be a blooming pain. Uh, but as I've described in previous videos, what you do with something like this is you bring in your second iron, because then there you go, it's molten straight away. Whether the pin has come out or not remains to be seen, it looks like it has. So the connections of the battery came out from this side actually, I've just uh, removed them. So I just need to now just clean the surface uh, of these here, so I can only do it like this, From the, I've got to be up close against the board. I can use the fiberglass pen though, just to show you. Yeah, we just need to get those uh, looking nice and shiny again. Up here needs some work, I'm going to have to do some close-up work on that. Uh, I'll get some nail polish on there, I think, before I fit the battery. Um, I'm not going to need much on this, I think I'm just going to cover this bit here. I'm going to leave the trace here, as is, for the real-time clock. The worst that can happen is at some point we get a break in that. I just need to just put a couple of fixed wires on, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be okay. Um, and this is a similar thing up here, I might just leave this exposed as well, I don't think there's any bits of copper or anything around there that needs covering over. There might be a little bit here, and a little bit up there. So I'll perhaps get a little bit more nail polish on there in a minute, but that's uh, as much as I'm going to put on, there's just a few tiny little bits as you can see. Uh, so with regards to the battery, um, yeah I need to scrape off that as well once that dries. Um, this is the positive side here, and if I can test this resistor, we've got short. So this is the resistor that uh, feeds the battery, I think. Yeah, yeah, it will be. So I've removed our 803 here, which feeds the battery. We'll get one of these shocked key diodes, or Scotty diodes as I call them, because I can't blooming say the name. I never have been able to. Uh, and it wants to go this way, because this side here is connected directly here. So the battery is going to feed this way, it's going to be one way to the uh, real-time clock chip here, so yeah, I just need to bend the legs approximately to where they need to be, which is about there, I think, uh, and get that in there. So I've got the battery holder on there, I just need to clean up uh, the contacts and things now, clean up where I fit the diode over here, and then we'll give it a test. Uh, at that point, if it works, if the clock works okay, uh, I will then perhaps uh, just give it one final inspection and then start to reassemble and we'll clean up the case. In a, maybe in a future video, I might not show it, I don't know, I'll do a recap on this. Um, I mean I swapped out the main four caps on that other, you know, that Rev 4 
bought in a previous uh, in the previous video there or previous few videos. But uh, I've not got any of those caps left actually. I need to order some uh, Panasonics. Uh, and if I'm honest, I'd like to perhaps recap it completely. You know, replace every cap on here. Although you don't really need to. Although I'll guarantee if I measure the caps on this, they'll be all right. So I haven't got the battery in there at the moment. So I want to just see if it powers on first of all. After I've cleaned it all up and stuff. And yeah, seems to be working. Let's just wait for the uh, disc icon and then we'll measure the voltage on the battery bay there. I just want to make sure this, there isn't 5 volts going to it. Uh, so if we go from ground down here, and it's that pin up there, as you can see, 3.1 volts. So yeah, it's good. Uh, I'm not going to show you how to set it because I covered that in a previous uh, 2000 repair video there and one of the 500 boards. But I'll just set the time and date and we'll uh, power it off after it's been set. Leave it for a few minutes, power it back on, see if it's held it. Now this is an unexpected uh, twist in events. It came up saying battery backed up, clock not found one booting. I thought, well, I'll go through the options and try and save it anyway. And uh, it's doing just the same thing. It's not finding the clock. So I need to test the connectivity around there. Uh, we must have one connection to the RTC chip, not there. So I could be wrong here, but I've been trying to uh, scope the uh, clock. I should put it back on DC. If I show you some of the pins around here, yeah, it's off the top there. Can you see that? But we're getting pulses. Um, if I go to the clock pin, on. can you see that? It's just got like a little bit of jitter there. That's one of the clock pins. Uh, yeah, and if I probe the crystal pins themselves, I don't you can see that. There's just nothing, just like a little bit of jitter or something, that you know, noise in the background. So I think the crystal's gone. I think so. Uh, I can't be 100% sure with this blooming scope, but I think so. It's never let me down in terms of not showing a signal at all. That's only in the region of 32.768 kilohertz, so that must be what it is. Well, I had some real shenanigans going on with this uh, real-time clock chip, for sure. I took off this cap, you know, I'd already sprayed some contact cleaner in and wiggled it a bit. It's a trim cap. You have a, a, a standard capacitor, you know, this yellow one here, on one side of the cap. It's like 22 picofarad or something like that. And then this variable one on the other. And you can just tr tweak, tweak, tweak it to just to get the, uh, you know, the clock signal just perfect there. There's a bit of flux on the top side there, I need to clean that off in a minute. That didn't solve it. I took the cap off, resoldered it. At the same time as I removed this transistor, tested all its connections, it was okay. Soldered it back on. Spotted a, a, a questionable point in one of these resistors on the underside. It looked like a little mini fracture. So I resoldered that, put those two things back on, powered it back up, and now it's all right. So now I'm left with a dilemma of, was it a bad connection on the transistor? Was it that, uh, I couldn't be 100% sure it was a cracked point on one of the resistors here, um, or was it, the trim cap and heating it obviously is obviously you know it heats the surface there so if there was any crystallized stuff inside there in combination with the uh, you know spray that I put in there before and the heat maybe it cleaned up the trim cap I don't know we'll just probe this again in a minute to see if the clock is there you know the crystal of the frequency because that's the other weird thing is I didn't get anything on my scope you know when I was looking at it that really puzzled me but as you can see now, real-time clock, okay. And you can see the uh, time going up there. Uh, yeah, I'm completely stark as an ear man, by the way. <laughs> Too much information. Yeah, I'm onto the right tracks, because if I probe one of the uh, clock pins now, can you see that? We've got a nice sine wave. Now, there was absolutely nothing there before. Um, I don't think it could be this cap. I, it's more likely to be this transistor. It's pro I think this transistor has a relationship to the... Uh, chip enable you know the chip select so just maybe we had a bad connection there um, but then would the chip need to be able to have the oscillation here I don't think it would actually it must have been that trim cap can't have been anything else but uh, anyway nevertheless we have fixed it so I probably wasted close to an hour on that bleeding real-time clock what a pain that was Anyway, I am glad it is okay, so I'm just going to give it one final uh, look over and we'll clean up the uh, rest of it and get this back in. So whilst inspecting there, I noticed that the two audio coupling caps were different types. One of them has been swapped out, as you can see. Uh, yeah, it's a higher voltage, 35 volts. I oh, know they're both 35 volts, but anyway, the different makes, it looked like one of them has been swapped. Um, I'm not sure which one's 
the one that's been swapped now. But nevertheless, I swapped those out as well. I've got some of those Nichicon Muse, uh, you know, audio quality, you know, super high quality audio uh, caps, the bipolars. But anyway, so I've swapped those two out and just marked the tops. But as I say, I will revisit this board at some point and swap out the remaining ones. So the next thing to do here is just give the case a quick wipe down. You can see, look, it's uh, black. So I'm looking a lot cleaner in there now, but there's some rust. We've got some rust on there and some rust on here. So I'm just going to use the wire brush and the fiberglass pen. You know, I'll just tilt this uh, on its side, you know, just to make it easier to do. And just uh, deal with the bits of corrosion there. Yeah, so I'll go over it with the uh, wire brush to start with, I think, just because it's quite thick. Once we've got rid of it, I'll just do my normal thing of wiping over it with uh, a rag with some WD-40 on it. Yeah, it's coming off okay there, as you can see. That's just the fiberglass pen now, just smoothing it off a little bit. So I'll just go over that now with some WD. Still going to look a bit ready there, but you know, it's like I said, bear in mind we're covering this with a solvent. It's a kind of oil as well, you know, it leaves a protective uh, surface on the spreading, doing a good job of spreading the redness around, aren't I? Let's just get a new piece. In Europe, Germany was the sort of central hub for manufacturing and stuff for these. Obviously, Commodore was primarily an American company, so, uh, you know, I'm sure they did a lot more manufacturing in the States, maybe. But lots of these European models did come from Germany. So, before we get the board back in, this was something I noticed when I first took it to pieces. One of these here has been moved, that should be in there like that. You know, you can unclip them and clip them in, so just make sure those are all uh, firmly in place there. These are obviously, uh, let's see the one there's out. These are obviously channels to uh, support you know, a full length card. You know, it's going to go the full length here and it's just going to slide like that. So I'll just try and gradually get the motherboard in position here. And slide it uh, down. It's probably going to need to go in back side here, go yeah, the back end first to get all of those connectors into the right places. Quite fiddly because can you see back here, this has got to go through there at the same time as you get that through there. So, I'm not sure if there's skill to this or what. I guess you could try like that maybe. Yeah, there you go. So, that's that. Move the cables out of the way. And then we just got to try and push it down onto its plastic mounts, wherever those are. There's one there. Screw point there. Yeah, and there's only like, I don't know, three or four screws hold the board in, but just make sure that's in. It seems to be. So the final screw into this corner here. As I say, we'll be going into this at some point anyway to recap it again. So no missing screws up until now. I think it's just the case screws and I've ordered some replacements which I'll show you in a minute. We'll put five uh, brand new screws on the outside. But the next thing we need to do is get this support brace back in place. So as you, you've got a nut and a washer on one side here. I'll just remove those. Yeah, so we'll just leave that resting there. And then this sits from here to one of the positions there, like that. That's it. So I'll put the screw in the other side first. That should hold the uh, expansion flap in. There we go. And then there was a washer and the nut on this side. So I'll need my pliers to just tighten that up. The brace looks a little bit bent, actually. Like it's had a bit of an impact at some point. Yeah, there we go, that's pretty tight. So all that does is give you some rigidity, you know, uh, between the front and the back of the case. It could do with two of these, really, I guess, but you've got something on the other side there. You've got the main bay that has the, you know, holds the power supply, holds the floppy drive, so it's going to be quite strong. It, that's just like an extra support for this side, really. So next, I think we'll clean up the uh, top part of the lid here. I'll just uh, pull that sticker off there. And again, just initially soap and water here. It's a uh, pretty diluted washing up liquid. Yes, yeah, so there's going to be some scratches like that that we ain't going to be able to get off. I suspect the majority of the marks on the top are not going to come off, but we just need to get the dirt off it. It's going to look a lot better when all the dirt's removed. So the next thing we'll try is a bit of IPA on some of these marks. Some might clean up a little bit, others might not. Yeah, one or two of those have cleaned up actually. Can you see that? That's looking a lot better already. So that circular one there, that foot off, something's been set on top of it, maybe from the monitor. 
but again the majority of that has come off look it's quite good actually see if we can clean that scratch there up somewhat yeah that's cleaned up a bit as well you're never going to get them perfect because they're going to have bits where the paint has been actually scratched off you know and that's always going to be the case unless you were to respray it so that's the front pretty well cleaned up i just need to get the uh, drive bay in now so we've got some of these m4 bolts here for holding this here i'm using the good ones on the inside ones that are not sort of all gray and oxidized the reason being is i've bought some brand new ones of these and some split washers as well so that I can replace the ones I'm missing on the outside because these are the same size as the ones missing on the outside. So I covered the floppy drive previously but I might uh, cover that in another video and do a complete uh, tear down of it and stuff and clean it all up. You can see someone's cable tied the uh, power things around each other here and I don't quite mind that actually because we don't need those uh, Molex connectors at the moment. I was just connecting my Logic Pro to those before. So we'll just uh, plug the power connector back in just make sure it's correctly aligned. The last thing you want to do is get that misaligned by one or two pins or something and then power it on and find you've uh, fed 12 volts somewhere you didn't intend to uh, so yeah that's that so this is the point where some of the screws were missing we had uh, one of these here uh, is that the same as these yeah it's marginally deeper isn't it but anyway that was here I think like that but then we had one missing here so uh, the one we got missing there let me think about this yeah i've got two more of these uh, shiny ones that were on the inside that go down there so i'll stick those there but then for the lid itself i've got a whole bag of these here so we'll get one two three four five for the case and then one to place that with there uh, and then i got some brand new m4 uh, washers as well because these do have a washer uh, let's just see if this is the right size. I'm, I think this is M4. Let's just see if that'll fit in there. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So we've got a brand new M4 uh, bolt there. Nice and shiny. I should go and get me the screwdriver actually. In fact, I'm going to do that because it makes a better fit with those bolts. Yeah, here we go. Better screwdriver. Switch the torque thing off. Hang on. Yeah, so better screwdriver, nice tight fit. So before I stick the lid back on, I'm just uh, powering this up to try it. So that's a good sign, let's stick the workbench in. Be interested to see if it's held the time of day, all that time I've been messing around with the case and stuff. There's no reason why it shouldn't, but you never know. Yeah, there we go. So the other thing we need to do here is uh, stick this piece of sponge back down. You can see where it's come out from there. Now it's taped, but you know what? That's not going to stay stuck. So I'm just going to use some of this uh, elasticy glue here. It's just like uh, you know, kind of a rubbery glue. I can get the darn thing open. Yeah, that should do. That's more than enough. By the time I've spread that around and it's been pressed down, that should at least secure it back on there. So it doesn't just keep falling off every two minutes. It's not essential, but you know, it just kind of makes it complete, doesn't it? So it wants to go that way. Like that. That's it. We just let that uh, set. It's going to take a number of hours, probably. So to get the lid back on, we'll just sort of sit it over the top and then slide it backwards like that yeah perfect size thank god for that so the case is a bit battered up on the uh, sides in particular but you know what it's pretty hard to find one of these it's not suffered some uh, damage in the past you know on the case and the final brand new bolts on the back uh, again with its washer sorted so no missing screws and there we have it all done so yeah just for the moment as I showed uh, in a previous video I am using uh, an A500 keyboard here it needs a vacuum actually it's got dust and hairs and all sorts on it just with my own little adapter cable here yeah it should have some heat shrink tubing or something around it but it's just useful for testing purposes I will get a proper keyboard at some point excellent 
I'll get some games running on it in a minute. Actually, I'm just uh, curious to see what it looks like on the CRT here. But it's up to round 411. It's been going around for a few hours there, no problems at all. It's rock solid. You can see how much yellower the uh, mortar is to the uh, 2000 there. The 2000's hardly got any uh, fading or anything on it. You know, sometimes they go uh, a deeper sort of yellow than the, the greeny grey that they, uh, they are there. Although I think they looked a bit more brownish to start with, like a light brown. So it certainly has been affected by the sunlight here. I need to get a replacement door for this uh, 1084S. If uh, you're watching this out there and you've got one, you don't mind selling it, uh, please let me know. The alternative is maybe someone could 3D print one or point me towards a model that might fit that. I'm not sure. It'd be nice to just get a door for that monitor at some point. So it looks amazing uh, on the CRT here. It's uh, a subject I've talked about before actually. It was when I did the Dreamcast video, I think. When I was talking about scanline generators, when you, why we use them and uh, why scanlines look so nice. And it's uh, anti-aliasing for the brain kind of thing. It's like, uh, you know, it, makes, it rounds off the edges. It gives, uh, instead of having sharp, pixely, square edges and things, you kind of get a, a nice, round, anti-aliased uh, edge to everything. At least that's how it seems to trick the brain into, you know, the optical part of your brain into seeing the image anyway. Um, because I guess there is some natural blurriness with the CRT. But it is also about the scan lines there. Sweet. Sounds great in stereo on that monitor as well, the sound you know, distinctly coming out of each uh, side of the uh, monitor chassis. I filmed this a few weeks ago actually. The part I'm recording now, the end bit, I haven't actually done. But this part of the video I've actually filmed uh, t tonight actually while I'm editing the video, so uh, it'll probably go up tonight actually. I'm probably going to upload it after it finishes rendering. It'll probably be up about 10 or 11 o'clock tonight I would think. But I had to do some sort of follow-up, following up from my video the other day. It's very difficult to follow on from something like that because, <clears throat> you know, even if I watch a few seconds of that video now, I can start to get myself into a bad place again. And just thinking about how bad things were just a few days ago, uh, it, it would be easy for me to break down. And that's the other reason, actually, I haven't done the uh, TF330 giveaway just yet because I need to do a live stream for that because I want people to see the draw so that you can see it's, it's, there's no, you know, I'm not rigging it or anything for a favourite person I might want to win, you know, win the, uh, the 330 there. But it is important that I just say something sooner rather than later. And from the bottom of my heart, I've got to thank everybody, all the people on Twitter, the, my Patreons, I've got a lot of Patreon pledges, and I appreciate that maybe some of you won't be able to maintain those for a period of time and stuff, because there, there were some fairly generous donations that's, which are helping out significantly. Um, but I am very, very grateful for all of the support, whether it's a dollar or two on Patreon, the comments of support, the comments of motivation, ideas, suggestions, etc. Uh, I just can't thank everybody enough. I really can't. It just goes to show that there, is, there are lots of good people out there. You know, lots, you're all good people. Seriously, everybody who watches my channel, the support I've had, you're all fantastic. And I couldn't do this channel without you. And it wouldn't have been able to continue without your help. So I'm very, very grateful. Even the donations, I mentioned in that video the other day, I had some donations recently, some boards and things. We've got another Amiga 2000 board coming up in another video. I'll keep you informed, uh, hopefully over the next few weeks or months, things will settle down a bit. I suspect it's gonna be a really tough 12 months for me. I really do, because even with the things that I've got that I think might come to fruition, if that's the right way of phrasing it, it's gonna be a really tough year, you know. Yeah, I can't thank you enough. So I hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.